بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما الا وان اصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير هدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدع وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد so today inshallah ta'ala i want to discuss a topic that should be beneficial to anyone who believes in Allah in the last day and likewise it's a topic that should bring joy to the heart and ease to the soul that topic is having hope in the vast mercy of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala so how many times does a person commit a sin or fall into error and he may transgress the bounds and lose hope in the mercy of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala thus becoming depressed and be fallen into a sad state of mind or how many times do you advise your brother or your sister in Islam or a muslim that you know and you say to them fear Allah make toba Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you and you find that the statement or the reaction that comes from them is a statement of despair or is a statement of someone who seems to have lost hope in the mercy of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala so a person says akhi i'm not on my re- my deen or i'm not on my religion i can't come to the masjid or i can't leave off that sin i commit that sin too much every time i try i fall back into it statements of a person who seems to have lost hope in the mercy of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala but perhaps these people they aren't aware of the hadith that inshallah ta'ala will read today perhaps they're ignorant of this hadith and they don't know of this hadith which as we said brings joy to the heart of the believer or to the person who falls into sin and that hadith is the hadith that's narrated on Anas ibn Malik radi Allahu anhu qal سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول قال الله تعالى يا بني ادم انك ما دعوتني ورجوتني غفرت لك على ما كان منك ولا ابالي يا بني ادم لو بلغت ذنوبك عنان السماء ثم استغفرتني غفرت لك يا بني ادم انك لو اتيتني بقراب الارض خطايا ثم لقيتني لا تشرك بي شيء او لا تشرك بي شيئا لا اتيتك بقرابها مغفره رواه الترمذي 
وَسَحَّحَهُ الْإِمَامِ الْبَانِي رَحِيمَهُ الله. The hadith reads, On the authority of Anas, رضي الله عنه, I heard the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم saying, O son, or sons, or children of Adam, or child of Adam, as long as you hope in me and call on me, I will forgive you for what you have done, and I will not mind. O son, or child of Adam, if your sins were to reach the clouds of the sky, if your sins were to reach the clouds of the sky, or as far as the eyes could see, or as far as the eyes could see, then you were to ask forgiveness of me, I will forgive you. O son, or child of Adam, were you to come to me with sins which nearly filled the earth, sins which nearly filled the earth, and then you were to meet me, ascribing no partners with me, I would come to you with an equal amount of forgiveness. And the hadith was collected by Tirmidhi and declared authentic by Al-Imam Al-Albani, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And the message in the hadith is abundantly clear for everyone. The vast forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But however, we'll break down the hadith and examine some of the words of the scholars pertaining to the benefits that come from it. And this is the way of Ahlu Sunnati wal Jama'ah. We turn to the ulama and we respect the ulama and we don't put our understandings in front of the ulama, whether we look to them to aid us in understanding the text of the Quran and Sunnah. We're not like the people who are laymen or general people or even beginning students of knowledge or even advanced students of knowledge who take it upon themselves to put themselves in front of the ulama because the ulama they possess things that the student of knowledge doesn't possess early in his seeking of knowledge. And one of those things is wisdom and putting things in their, in their proper place. So we'll look at some of the benefits briefly from this particular hadith, like we said, which are abundantly clear. The first benefit of this hadith that we read is coming to know the vast favor of Allah, who subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that he forgives the sins of his slaves. That Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala, we learn of his vast favor and the fact that he forgives the sins of his slaves. The second benefit from this hadith is that a reason for forgiveness of sins is supplicating and asking Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala whilst having hope in him and without showing despair. That a reason for sins to be forgiven is that you supplicate and ask Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala and that you have hope in him. And you do not show despair. The third benefit is the virtue of seeking forgiveness coupled with repentance. And that Allah forgives those who seek forgiveness for their sins. No matter, and the point is no matter how great in number they are. How great in number they are. In the hadith, he mentions if, as if it was, if, even if it was close to the whole earth being filled up with sins or your sins, he would still forgive you. The fourth benefit is polytheism and associating partners with Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sin that won't be forgiven. Because in the hadith it mentions that if you were to meet me, ascribing no partners with me. So the sin of polytheism and associating partners with Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala is a sin that's not forgiven. The fifth benefit or continuing with the fourth benefit and that anything other than anything other than polytheism is under the will of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala if he desires to forgive it then he will forgive it the fifth benefit is the virtue of making worship completely for Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala having tawhid and that tawhid or monotheism is a reason for sins to be forgiven and we ask Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who constantly hope in the mercy of Allah who subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't despair.
Bismillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah. The second topic that I wanted to discuss in this khutbah is the topic that's extremely important in these days and times. Especially in the realms of, of social media, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, text messaging, whatever the case may be. And that topic is knowing or understanding the importance of who you take your Islamic knowledge from. On Facebook, there are hundreds of people that give da'wah, maybe thousands. Likewise, Twitter, likewise, Instagram, likewise, text messages. These are places where Islamic knowledge is spread. And it's important for a person to understand that he knows where he takes his Islamic knowledge from and who he takes his Islamic knowledge from. The ulama, they've broken down knowledge into two categories. Knowledge which is something that has to be obtained individually. And knowledge which is a communal knowledge. Such as if some of the people know it, then the obligation falls or is removed from the rest of the community. But what's important now is the first type of category, which is individual knowledge, such as prayer, such as fasting, such as tawheed. These are things that a person is individually responsible for learning. It's things that he must learn himself and someone else can't learn it for him. So if this fact is established that a person has to seek knowledge, the question remains, who do you seek knowledge from? This individual knowledge that is obligatory for you to seek. Who do you seek knowledge from? Do you just seek knowledge from? From anyone and anybody? Or are you cautious about that? And we want to read from a brief paragraph from our Sheikh Ahmed Ibn Umar Bazmo, Hafizahullah Ta'ala wherein he discusses a mind frame of some people that we don't want to fall into. We're mentioning this mind frame or this mindset of this particular group of people so that we're not from them. And he mentions that, and from the strangest of things regarding some people, is that if they need a service related to the worldly life, something related to their dunya, something related to what's going on in this world, then they search for the, the best group of people, the best company, they search for the best. And even after they've found the best, maybe they find five or six people that are considered to be the best, that still isn't good enough for them. They still seek to find out which one of those five or six people is the best from the best. So once they find out who's the best, then they take that person's statement, and that's the statement that they act by. And this is how people, he mentions, this is how people act with regard to their worldly life. They search for the best of the best. But he mentions, as it relates to the affairs of religion, as it relates to their affairs of the religion, and the legislation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that some people aren't concerned at all from who they take their knowledge from. It doesn't bother them in the least bit who they take from anywhere they take. And they act on the statement of anyone to the point where some people don't even bother to ask about the affairs of the religion. They think that something is correct and they do it. They don't even ask. Aslan. And he mentions that there is no mistake or no doubt that this is a mistake and it's a cause for tribulation and misguidance in the religion. And like we said, we mentioned this in order not to fall into this, this type of mindset and to always look for the best of the best when seeking your knowledge of your religion. And we want to compare what was just said previously to the actions of the Salaf, the mind frame or the mindset that we just mentioned previously. We want to compare it to the actions of the, of the Salaf who didn't display negligence and who they took their knowledge from. And we'll mention one narration, which is sufficient for someone from Ahlul Sunnah. And this narration is narrated on Ibn Sirin. And he mentions, Ibn Sirin, لَمْ يَكُونُوا يَسْأَلُونَ عَنَ الْإِسْنَادِ 
فلما وقعت الفتنة قالوا سموا لنا رجالكم فينظر إلى أهل السنة فيأخذ حديثهم وينظر إلى أهل البدع فلا يأخذ حديثهم إمسرين he said we didn't used to ask for or we didn't used to ask about the chain of narration we didn't used to ask about the train of narration and then there occurred tribulation and trials and from those tribulations and trials is innovation in the religion and this is Ibn Serene speaking over a thousand years ago so how much now in 1434 of trials and tribulations and innovation is around so he mentioned we didn't used to ask about the chain of narration then when the tribulation occurred trials and tribulation occurred we started to say or we said name us your men name us your name us your men who, who are you narrating on the point is they begin to examine who were they who they were taking knowledge from name us your men so we would see who was from Ahlul Sunnah and we would see from those men, we would see who was from Ahlul Sunnah and take their hadith. And we would see who was from Ahlul Bid'ah and we wouldn't take them, we wouldn't take their hadith. So an advice to my brothers and sisters is to cling to the methodology of the Salaf as it relates to seeking knowledge in who you take your knowledge from. Stick to the, the well-known masajid of Ahlul Sunnah. Stick to the well-known call callers of Ahlul Sunnah. Stick to the well-known websites of Ahlul Sunnah. And don't just take your internet knowledge from anywhere. And one of the most effective ways, one of the most effective ways in knowing who to take knowledge from in these days and time is referring to the ulama and referring to their and referring to their students who will aid you in understanding who to take your knowledge from and who not to take your knowledge from. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us sincerity in our religion. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are recipients of his of his mercy. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from protect us to protect us from misguidance and misguiding others. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.